Kirtipa, you checked uh, yours, so uh, it is coming. See, yes, ma'am. I'm just checking. My slides are like a slide. That video. Slide I'll just check my sh slides uh, sharing ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is my uh, are my slides visible, sir? Yes, 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 yes. Oh. I just like to do that. Okay. Uh, these are Lipika ma'am slide. I'll be sharing it from my screen. Lights, lights, lights. Yes, sir, it's okay. Just, so, we are not able to share the slides, sir. Screen sharing is okay. Uh, Ashish, sir, if I may help you. Yeah. yeah. What you can do is uh, on your PowerPoint, you put on slideshow mode. <laughs> Okay. okay. In the presentation, you put that uh, uh, class uh, icon, you put press on that, your screen will become a slideshow. Now, uh, but I have to initially minimize this. Huh. Matlab, uh, yes, minimize this zoom screen. Okay. Is not getting minimized. So, okay. Uh, okay, sir. How about this? You go, you press Alt Tab, Alt uh, button on your uh, keypad with Tab. When you Which do one? that, Alt and Tab together. Alt, 
and tab okay when you press alt and tab all your windows are will be shown now we have gone back to digi screen uh, sir alt and tab me you get all the tabs which are open on your screen is that coming or no no i will try again alt and tab press together uh, no uh, just जस्ट ऑल्ट एंड देन उसके बाद आप टैप दबाएंगे इसमें आपके सारे टैप्स जो खुले हैं वो दिखेंगे वो आ रहा है क्या और कृतिक का अदरवाइज यू कैन टेक द स्लाइड्स ऑफ आर्टिस्ट एंड यू कैन शो देम या या यस मैम आई आल्सो फील दैट या इट्स कमिंग मैम माय ट्रांसलेशन इज कमिंग अदर टॉपिक्स जस्ट वन मिनट ये पूर्ण बंद कर दे हां नरेंद्र सर स्क्रीन इज जस्ट वन मिनट for viewers uh, it will take hardly 2 minutes uh, to start the session today we have almost uh, uh, what i can say four um, movies in one ticket like that so two speakers today they will uh, talk on all uh, obgy uh, problems of heart and uh, related to that uh, so uh, please uh, be patiently wait the uh, show will start immediately uh, i will i want to share this thing that uh, today's topics are obstetrician in distress uh, anesthesiologist in stress uh, will be presented by dr uh, ashish mali sir he is a associate professor at uh, topiwala nair and uh, bol nair hospital uh, next topic will be a tale of regurgitant heart lesions uh, it will be a parturient with mitral regurgitation for seizures and uh, this one will be presented by dr narendra kumar he is a assistant professor at uh, nair hospital nair hospital the third one will be uh, again one regurgitant heart patient and that will be a uh, parturient with aortic uh, regurgitation for seizure uh, it will be presented by dr kritika yadav she is a senior resident at nair hospital and last uh, ma'am will be take and that will be key points for the practice of obstetric anesthesia uh, she will deliver us a com message for obgy cases in our private practice so let on your seat belts we will soon start the session are you ready sir ashish sir minutes two minutes stop sir. sharing please yeah okay okay depend uh, this echo is coming from uh, ashish mali sir's voice Okay, sir. Okay. I think he's using uh, two devices. Okay, okay, okay. Ashish sir, yes, sir. You are using two devices, so echo is coming. No, sir, single one only. It's okay. It, now, now it's coming. Okay. Okay, sir. So, uh, hello. Am I? Uh, are my slides visible, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's clearly. Should I uh, introduce? Uh, for 2 minutes then you start the screen sharing yes sir yeah uh, this is our uh, case meet on the eve of uh, ic flame and uh, our flame is coming on saturday evening our uh, plannings and uh, all things are going on from isa city brand and uh, on this eve we are uh, presenting case meet 38 on this platinum jubilee years uh, uh this one topics today's topic is obstetric uh, distress anesthetic in stress that we all know and uh, our uh, honorable uh, ma'am dr litika uh, is presenting with uh, her all team uh, this ops uh, topic previously we learn a lot from in uh, her about cath labs today's topics i uh, already mentioned about four speakers in one show and the 
first one will be stalwart dr ashish sir he is a associate professor uh, in department of anesthesia uh, in the tmc and ul nair hospital and uh, then presentation of dr narendra kumar he is assistant professor at same hospital nair hospital and then kritika yadav she is a senior resident she will speak on regurgitation of hearts and then after uh, keynotes from uh, lipika ma'am so on uh, platinum jubilee celebration of uh, our isa national plus uh, 25 years of silver jubilee years of our isa city brand nanded we are uh, doing this case mix uh, thank you thank you all uh, ashish sir you can start Sachin, I I would like to mention that uh, Dr. Ashish has been uh, planning to take up the obstetrics fellowship course uh, shortly, and okay. he is interested in obstetric anesthesia. He has recently come back with the experience uh, working in Hyderabad, so he can enlighten us more about uh, all these uh, all these points. Yes, yes, yes. Uh... Ashish sir is a senior uh, from uh, Nair Hospital and uh, a very humble person. Yeah. Can we start, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. yeah. Am I audible to all? Yes, yes. Yeah. You are audible. you can just start the today's topic for discussion today is obstetrics obstetrician in distress and anesthesiologist in stress so basically in this topic we are looking at how the distress of the obstetrician causes increase in the grades of anesthesiologist because they are already stressed by the anesthesia factors in addition the obstetrics gives a lot of distress we'll continue with the slides the first slide shows what the actual the obstetrician stress it is not an obstetric stress it is an obstetrician stress which ultimately causes the stress to the anesthetic there are problems like erratic routines hospital setup small nursing sir uh, above of... logo is there na one one logo uh, on above home there is play the slides if you ha, yes above oh. above the home file home insert draw is above in in brown brown area above brown area the work where sir the new no 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 on uh, left side left side sir acha uh, above that above that you just above above insert above oh. insert about that okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. click on that click it start from beginning it will be start ah yes yeah. this is better sir thank you yes 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 yeah so today's topic for discussion is obstetrician distress and anesthesiology in stress we are just going to mention what ultimately causes the stress to the anesthetist mm -hmm. coming to the first slide what exactly are the stress for the obstetrician that is erratic routines of there regarding the food sleep and the stress regarding the hospital setups because it small nursing homes gives them a lot of stress they are also always concerned regarding the two lives first one is the baby and second is the mother one more important whether they are able to reach in time when the patient is in labor currently the most important concerns are regarding the medico legal issues another one is blood and bleeding of the patient one of them addition is finding a good pediatrician monetary dynamics and the most important is finding a good anesthetist who can deliver the baby and the mother well now we are coming to the actual acute emergencies which are there for the obstetrician which ultimately cause stress to the anesthetist here you can see that the anesthetist only stress is remaining written only one time because every time this goes on increasing the stress of the anesthetist increases the most important of them are the fetal bradycardia and the cord prolapse here in each of the slides i will be just discussing what are the important concerns for the anesthetist in all of these condition the rest of the discussion will be doing by the further speakers in case of fetal bradycardia and cord prolapse important in this patient is maintaining the glucose the blood pressure and the oxygenation of the patient in case of dire emergency general anesthesia should be given to the patient taking into consideration thiopentone and scolins 
Another important factor in this is meconium stain lacquer, in which consideration has been taken with the pediatrician and the gynecologist, looking whether a rapid spinal can be given or general anesthesia should be given. In case of PIH, that is pregnancy induced hypertension, the concerns are whether it is a gestational hypertension, whether it is a chronic hypertension, whether it is a preeclampsia, whether it is an impending eclampsia, and, the, and whether it is an eclampsia. The concerns for the anesthetist which cause stress to him are something like the urine output, whether it is a health syndrome. Is the patient is in sepsis, magnesium sulfate regimes, which are followed by the gynecologist, whether the patient has some DIC problems or coagulation problems. One more addition to this is important whether the patient is taking which type of medication. The next point which comes in line is hemorrhage. Whether it is an antipartum hemorrhage or the postpartum hemorrhage, in both of them, the very important cause is rapid and acute loss of the blood and massive transfusion. In case of ruptured uterus and ruptured ectopic, right from the induction, it is very, very important regarding the BP, how the induction is going to how the induction is going to be done, invasive monitoring and post-operative care. In case of embolism, even if the patient is given spinal, it has to be converted to GA with oxygenation and the post-op shifting of the patient to the ICU. Next, in addition to this, the initial slide showed what are the acute problems. Now, these are showing the associated comorbid problems, which causes stress to the obstetrician. Now you can see the anesthetic is slowly getting stressed up. Hence, the stress stress is written two times. In this case, we have been seeing as we have been seeing the most important problem of pregnancy is anemia in pregnancy. Already the patient is in dilutional state with hypercoagulable state. In addition, the problems will be like thalassemia, megaloblastic anemia, and sickle cell anemia. In case of heart disease, care has to be taken whether it is a stenotic lesion or a regurgitative lesion, whether the patient has a dilated cardiomyopathy, intraoperative the patient may have CCF and even the post-op the patient may go in CCF. Also concern has to be taken regarding the any BMD was done previous or the valve was replaced anytime. In case of kidney diseases, concern of anesthesia will be the hemoglobin which is always on the lower side, potassium which may be on the higher side, whether the patient is having any urine output, what is the creatine status of the patient, whether the patient is any, uh, receiving any dialysis and whether the patient is on any other medications. Considering now the musculoskeletal systems, what are the main concerns are something which we call as the kyphoscoliosis. In this, there is problem regarding regional anesthesia because it is very, very difficult to locate the, locate the space and sonography may be useful in such cases. Also, giving GA will be very, very dangerous because the lung is already in the restrictive phases. Other important problems are something like myasthenic rabies, which may impend telling of the hyperthermia crisis. Also, rheumatoid arthritis is one of the problems which causes airway problems as well as the regional problems. In all of these cases, a card for difficult intubation has to be kept ready. We come to the next condition, what we call as the bronchial asthma. In this, concerns for the anesthetist is the patient may already be on steroids. There may be edema of the airways. The patient may be in the status of spasm. And last but not the least, the patient may go in edema. In elderly and precocious patient, as well as the IUGR, they may be an IVF conception. Hence, we cannot refuse a chance of patient being hypertensive. Also, other problems like hypothyroid may be already present for the patient. In case of multiple gestations, Things like decreasing the dose of spinal as well as PPH has to be considered. Before this, the two slides were only concerned regarding to the obstetrician which were giving stress to the anesthetist. Now, actually, the business comes when the anesthetist is stressed by his own problems, that is the anesthesia concern. Hence, now the stress is increased by three times, that is stress, stress, and stress. First of all, the consent. Second is the blood. Third is optimization of the patient. Time availability for optimization, surgical skills, availability of the pediatrician, and last but not the least, ICU and NICU facilities. Coming to the first, that is whether availability of the consent, that is whether the relatives were available or not. Are they blood relatives? Need for an alternative consent. Like if the patient's relative is not available or the patient has come in unconscious patient, then the administrative has to intervene in this. The most important part in this part is explanation of the risk involved in obstetrics and anesthesia that is regarding PPH, blood pressure, ICU, heart disease or asthmatic problem. Last but not the least is the denial of the consent. 
Sometimes the patient will not give consent for giving regional instead of GA. In this case, the pros and cons have to be explained. And even if this, the patient doesn't give a consent and negative consent has to be taken and the patient has to be proceeded with the procedure. Next important is regarding reservation of the blood and blood products. In this, concerns are availability of the blood in the hospital, how much tag, lag, tag line it is take, a time lag it is going to take for availability, blood groups and its components available in full swing, Rare blood groups like Bombay blood group always give a problem. Jehovah's Witness are a chronic problem. Even consent for the blood products have to be taken regarding reaction. And last but not the least, reaction, a transfusion reaction trial has to be considered. In case of the next point, which is unoptimized patients, many a times the patients are not nil by mouth. They may have just have clear fluids or full meal before the section and the obstetrician tells us to give the anesthesia. In this case, more concern for the anesthetic is because the progesterone causes decreases in the sphincter tone of the esophagus and also diaphragm is on the higher side because the gravid uterus presses on the stomach. Other concerns regarding un unoptimized patients are like coagulation issues, electrolyte disturbances and unavailability or non-availability of the investigations or sometimes a minimal of CBC will be available. In this case, we have to proceed with the investigation. The mere minimum, what we can do, we can just draw a sample of blood and send for the investigations, look at the clinical conditions of the, of the patient and proceed for the section because important are the two lives, that is the mother and the baby. Also, concern will be undiagnosed comorbid things, DIC and sepsis. After optimization, is the anesthetist have adequate time for optimization? This is because the time of optimization is very, very less. It starts from the admission counter to the patient coming to the operation theater. In case the patient is having spasm, in case the patient is having C, uh, CCF or the patient is hypovolemic, this all have to be considered and optimized by giving astalane or blood or whatever is required. Also, unoptimization or decreased optimization of the patient in the pre-operative period causes increased stay in the post-operative period and ICU, and ICU for the patient. This is not actually directly related, that is the surgical skill. This is actually not related to the anesthetist, but it actually affects the anesthetist because if the surgeon doesn't have good surgical skill, he can just remove the S and he can really kill the patient. So what is important in the patient is how much time should ideally be there. So some three to four minutes should be ideally present in case of GA for the baby delivery and about seven to eight minutes in case of regional. The case doesn't end here because the surgeon should be able to also manage the PPH, that is the hemorrhage of the patient, and also he should be saving the ureter and the peri-uterine peri areas. Here, the role of the anesthetist changes, that is the availability of the pediatrician. Suddenly, we may find that the pediatrician is not available and the anesthetist has been told to do the role of the pediatrician. He doesn't get any incentive, but he has to take care of both, that is the mother as well as baby. So it is very, very challenging job. Last but not the least is after the patient has been, section has been done, will the patient require ICU in view of PPH, PIH, embolism, any CVTS disorders, and whether the baby will require NICU. With this, I have some concluding note that what actually stresses the anesthetist when he gives GA to such patient, they are the aspiration, airway edema problems, pressure responses to copies, drugs that includes anesthetic drug as well as the gynecologic drugs, end organ concerns, awareness in GA and fetus himself. When he gives regional anesthesia to such patients, what are the stress factors? That is coagulation problems, finding the anatomical landmarks for giving regional, hypotension, level attained, PDPH, catheter migration, needle and catheter catastrophes and drug overdose and reactions. So in all, what can be described as the role given to the anesthetist and how can he do the role of the anesthetist in such conditions is first to calm the patient himself, calm the surgeon and the staff, be self calm to do the things, explain, take the risk. Ultimately, he has to give anesthesia, change the roles if required as a pediatrician and hope for the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Very nice presentation. And congratulations for your fellowship also.
from yeah, all so our uh, ISA city brand member will do on this uh, great achievements and your further studies. I think we will start next session. Then uh, last uh, uh, we'll uh, take question and answer sessions. Is it okay, sir? Yes, sir. I think Narayan is waiting for. Yes, sir. Doctor Kirtika is waiting for. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next, next yeah. is uh, I think Narendra and then Kritika. Whatever I can, uh, we can exchange. Doctor Kritika, I think. Yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. please start. No problem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Kritika, ma'am, please. Uh, so, uh, Ashish, sir, can you exit your sh shared screen, then I can. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, are my slides visible? Yes. Okay. Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Kirtika Yadav. I'm a senior resident at Naira Hospital. I'd like to continue my, uh, I'd like to continue this interesting discussion on a tale of regurgitant lesions by presenting to you all a case of about a parturient with severe aortic regurgitation presented for cesarean section. So the case, here's the case of a 22-year-old primary gravida at 36 weeks of gestation. She presented to the labor room with complaints of pain abdomen since one day. She was an unregistered pregnancy. And on uh, asking about her past history, we found out that she was a known case of rheumatic heart disease, diagnosed four years back, but she was not on any treatment medically or undergone any surgical correction prior to pregnancy. Uh, she had symptoms of breathlessness of NYHA grade two to three on exertion. Uh, and on and off complaints of palpitations and chest discomfort. However, she did not complain of any orthopnea or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea in this case. Uh, on examination, we found the patient had pallor with pedal edema, uh, which was spitting in type uh, extending up to her ankles. Vitally, she was afebrile with pulse rate of 102 beats per minute, which was regular in rhythm, high volume and collapsing pulse, uh, with all peripheral pulses felt. This is very characteristic of aortic regurgitation lesion. Her blood pressure showed uh, systolic blood pressure of 130 and diastolic of 62 with a wide pulse pressure, which is again characteristic of aortic regurgitation. Respiratory rate was 16 per minute at rest and saturation was 99% on room air. On systemic examination, her serious uh, examination revealed a hyperdynamic apex beat palpable in the sixth intercostal space lateral to mid axillary line. On auscultation, S1 and S2 were heard. However, we uh, recognized and identified a uh, diastolic murmur which was heard best in the aortic region, which is in the right intercostal, uh, right second intercostal space. Uh, her JVP was normal. On respiratory examination, air entry was bilaterally equal with no crepitations. So we ruled out any uh, signs and symptoms of heart failure in this case, which were, pres which were not present. On neurological and obstetric examination were within normal limits. Uh, we evaluated her preoperatively uh, by doing routine biochemical examination, which, which were normal, which were within normal limits. Uh, detailed cardiological evaluation showed ECG showing normal sinus rhythm with left axis deviation and left ventricular hypertrophy. 2D echo showed a dilated left ventricle with severe aortic regurgitation, a, a trileaflet aortic valve with mild MR and trivial PR. Uh, gradient across the valve was 52 by 32 millimeters of mercury. Dilated uh, ascending aorta with IVC collapsing. And there was no regional uh, wall motion abnormality or clot present. However, she had good diastolic and systolic function with ejection fraction of 60%. We sorted, uh, we, found, uh, we got her cardiology and cardiovascular surgery clearance done prior to surgery. Uh, room air ABG was also within normal limits and chest x-ray uh, was not done as uh, she was a, a pregnant woman. So here's the diagnosis of primary cavida at, at 36 weeks of uh, gestation with a known case of rheumatic heart disease with severe AR and mild MR with NYHA dyspnea of grade two to three, 
which is and she was not in heart failure and she was posted for elective cesarean section. So now why are we worried about party urians presenting with cardiovascular diseases? As we know, cardiovascular disease is very commonly uh, pre uh, complicating pregnancy nowadays and is the leading cause of maternal mortality, especially in the US. The prevalence is not only uh, increasing the development, but in an end This can be attributed to the fact that most women, uh, uh, the average maternal age is increased and the coexisting risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, and obesity can lead to cardiovascular disease. Uh, pregnancy on its own is associated with significant hemodynamic changes, and that can further aggravate any underlying uh, valvular heart disease in these cases. Uh, also, uh, signs and symptoms of pregnancy which are physiologically present uh, are similar to that of a cardiovascular disease, so we need to be very vigilant uh, in diagnosing these cases as we can easily miss them. Patients are, uh, who are not aware that they have a cardiovascular disease can, because of the hemodynamic stress of pregnancy, can present and be diagnosed for the first time in mid to late pregnancy. So we need to be increased and also the body pairs for the Dynamics uh, condition. The increase in plasma volume, the stroke volume increases, which is around 20 to 30 percent. And this contributes to an increase in cardiac output. Cardiac output uh, increases right from first trimester and reaches a maximum at 32 weeks. And it, it reaches uh, as high as 30 to 50. Uh, uh, continuous uh, mimetic uh, uh, sympatho, uh, uh, all the uh, because of anxiety and pain that can happen. And the cardiac output is maximum in the immediate postpartum period. Now, this is important. We need to know when the cardiac output is high because the patient can. Postpartum. Uh, aortic regurgitation is easily to, is uh, well tolerated during pregnancy because of the uh, decrease in systemic vascular resistance, which occurs because of uh, of uh, progesterone and uh, the placenta, which is a less resistant uh, circulation. The systemic vascular During pregnancy. So this is what I did prior to this, and this is presented in a graphical representation where we can see that the cardiac output uh, increases during first trimester, reaches its maximum during second and third trimester, but is highest, almost 80% of the baseline value, just immediate postpartum uh, uh, time. And the systemic vascular resistance, as we can see, uh, remains low throughout. At the same time, uh, the plasma volume is high because of which the preload is constantly maintained. So therefore, aortic regurgitation patients uh, tolerate uh, are uh, asymptomatic usually during pregnancy unless and until their left ventricular ejection fraction is decreased. Now, what are the normal pregnancy cardiovascular signs and symptoms that we, we need to know? It is very normal for patients to have easy fatigability, dyspnea, orthopnea, hyperventilation, chest pain because of uh, uh, esophageal reflux disease. Uh, signs such as tachycardia is common in pregnancy with non-specific ST changes are present. Peripheral edema is common, pseudocardiomegaly can occur because the diaphragm is pushed up and uh, uh, that pushes the uh, uh, heart laterally. So we can diagnose, mistake that for cardiomegaly, it's actually pseudocardiomegaly. Loud S1, S2 is normal to be heard and there is presence of S3 which is also normal as pregnancy is a volume overload hyperdynamic condition as I stated. Flow murmurs are also very common to be present in pregnancy. However, certain signs and symptoms which must alert the anesthesiologist into understanding that this patient might have an underlying heart disease and mandates further cardiological evaluation are symptoms such as severe progressive dyspnea, severe progressive orthopnea, any PND, hemoptysis, 
exertional dyspnea that the patient complains with uh, uh, with uh, effort any chest pain the patient has uh, especially related to effort or emotion or progressive or generalized pit, uh, it, uh, pitting pedal edema we need to uh, uh, be aware of these uh, symptoms signs such as cyanosis or clubbing persistent neck pain uh, distension a loud s4 any uh, diastolic murmur the systolic murmur grade 3 and above because less than that flow murmurs can be present which are normal any paradoxical splitting of the heart sound any sustained dysarrhythmia or pulmonary hypertension signs such as loud p2 and opening snap need to be uh, diagnosed identified and that should alert the anesthesiologist into one, into uh, further evaluating the patient for a heart disease now how to approach a patient with aortic regurgitation for elective cesarean section there are general principles that are to be followed for uh, any uh, pregnant patient with heart disease we need to understand that the mode of anesthesia depends on the hemodynamic status of the patient and obstetric indication however if the patient is asymptomatic usually the patient tend to do well during section or delivery but if the patient pre uh, during pregnancy has nyh uh, dyspnea of class 3 or 4 we should uh, be uh, very vigilant and understand the patient can have can tolerate the pregnancy poor uh, the delivery poorly and can have a uh, post operative ventilatory support or post operative intensive care required uh, it must be a multidisciplinary approach so cardiologists and cvts uh, surgery clearance need to be uh, sought and the perioperative manage management um, advice need to be followed we need to avoid or treat factors that can worsen heart disease which i'll be stating later the patient should be at bed rest with left lateral position to avoid any aortic cable compression uh, patient can be on diuretics and avoid volume overloading if the patient has ejection fraction which is less or is in heart failure uh, an effective endocarditis antibiotic prophylaxis is not routinely indicated in all patients but those patients who have undergone surgical correction and have prosthetic uh, valve uh, placed uh, pr prior to pregnancy need to be uh, given an effective endocarditis uh, antibiotic prophylaxis so therefore what are the goals of anesthetic management in these cases we need to do a thorough preoperative cardiac evaluation so that we can stratify the maternal and fetal risk and optimize the patient prior to surgery we need to prevent or, uh, uh, prevent or treat factors that can cause decompensation and can lead to heart failure in these patients antibiotic prophylaxis need to be given um anticoagulation if the, sometimes the patient may be on the uh, anticoagulation for uh, thromboembolism prophylaxis so we need to be mindful of that if you are uh, planning on giving regional anesthesia and we need to follow uh, the appropriate astra gu guidelines for the same ensure adequate analgesia during the uh, during the delivery and even postpartum uh, hemodynamic monitoring if required we may need to go for invasive intra uh, invasive intraoperative and postoperative monitoring as well uh, we need to optimize the cardiovascular function as per the cardiac grid of uh, the uh, valvular heart disease and we need to ensure that uh, measures for resuscitation and postoperative intensive care are ready so the factors that can worsen the heart disease that we need to avoid are anxiety pain any uh, exercise salt and water retention that can cause heart failure treat anemia treat any infection any uh, sustained dysarrhythmia that the patient can have and thromboembolism uh, and any thromboembolism embolism that can happen so we need to ensure the patient is undergoing treatment or is undergoing prophylaxis for the same the way we uh, can uh, stratify uh, the risk in uh, for pregnant women uh, who have cardiovascular disease is by using the modified who criteria we understand the risk assessment is difficult and the the severity can change during pregnancy also so we need to uh, have an ongoing assessment and have a tailored approach based on the baseline severity of valvular heart disease uh, according to aha and acc uh, there is Uh, ideally the patient with valvular heart disease should undergo preconception evaluation and counseling however sometimes they just present uh, as as was the case here uh, the patient was unregistered therefore we could not uh, uh, the patient was not under any treatment prior to this according to the european society of cardiology we need to uh, it recommends an integrated risk stratification which is known as a modified who criteria what they have done is they have uh, stratified the risk as per class 1 2 3 and 4 in increasing order of uh, maternal uh, risk and the and uh, based on the cardiac lesion they have uh, uh, stratified accordingly as you can see most of the native or tissue valvular heart disease which do not fall under class 1 or class 4 are actually class 2 to 3 which means the patient are in moderate to increased risk of maternal mortality or morbidity the same thing is shown in this table here i would like to point that uh, as our patient is falling under class 2 to 3 the patient can have a, a, a cardiac event rate as high as 10 to 15, 19% percent. 
and the the patient is at increased risk of maternal mortality almost intermediate level to, and moderate to severe risk of morbidity so we need to counsel the patient accordingly and uh, ensure that we have taken high risk consent uh, we also need to know here it is uh, showing that the care during pregnancy needs to be a referral hospital uh, ideally a tertiary hospital will do with where the patient has a cardio cardiologist also to treat patient post postpartum so there are some risk factors that we need to be aware of and which we should be uh, uh, mindful of when we are evaluating these patients. Uh, they are maternal non-cardiac risk factors such as smoking or multiple gestation and cardiac risk factors such as the presence of mechanical valve prosthesis, any anticoagulation therapy the patient is on, uh, moderate to severe left-sided obstruction cases and a presence of cyanosis and NYHA dyspnea class 2 or above should uh, 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 make us more vigilant in these cases. Uh, in valvular heart disease, high risk indicators are those of uh, WHO criteria class 4. These patients can have severe symptomatic AS or MS, any cardiomyopathy, low ejection fraction less than or equal to 30%, any Marfan syndrome with aortic root more than 45 millimeters, uh, isomangarization syndrome, uh, pulmonary hypertension or peri uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy. These are all high risk indicators in valvular heart disease and we need to be very careful in these patients as the most common complications in these patients are heart failure and postpartum hemorrhage. So as I said, the goals of anesthetic manage management were to stratify the risk. After that, we uh, ensure the patient has, uh, uh, if the patient is on anticoagulation uh, for thromboprophylaxis, we need to be mindful of regional anesthesia. Normally, the patients who have mechanical prosthetic valve uh, uh, replacement done are on anticoagulation. Uh, anticoagulant, anticoagulant of choice is warfarin, which is a vitamin K antagonist. It is usually safe but it can cause uh, fetal embryopathy in the first trimester, so we need to be mindful. Um, normally, the patients are shifted to unfractionated uh, heparin or low molecular uh, weight heparin just prior to delivery. Uh, but there are, there are, there's a higher risk of uh, thromboembolism with these cases, and they're difficult to titrate. Uh, oral or direct thrombin inhibitors like dapigatran and anti-10A drugs such as rivaroxaban and apixaban should be avoided in pregnancy. Uh, regional anesthesia, if the patient is on anticoagulation, we need to follow ASRA guidelines because there's a high risk of spinal hematoma. Uh, some patients who have, ha uh, who have a history of atrial fibrillation or prior history of thromboembolic episode, they should be put on low-dose aspirin usually. Now, what is the mode of anesthesia for C-section? It usually depends on the hemodynamic status and obstetric indication. Uh, preferably, we use regional anesthesia, as we did in this case where we used combined low-dose spinal epidural anesthesia uh, by giving 5 mg uh, heavy bupivacaine spinal dose after securing the epidural catheter. Uh, general anesthesia can be given, but uh, the, it's usually reserved for patients with severe AR with decreased ejection fraction with high chance of going into heart failure and hemodynamic instability. Uh, there is, uh, however, it is very important to note that there's no evidence to support any particular technique is superior or not, but cardiovascular stability is the goal, whichever technique you use. So what is the cardiac uh, cause of uh, aortic uh, regurgitation in pregnancy? Uh, aortic regurgitation occurs because of the failure of aortic leaflet cooperation. It can be due to defect in leaflet or aortic root. It can be because of congenital bicuspid valve. Most commonly in the developing countries, it's because of rheumatic heart disease. Some connective, dis connective di uh, tissue disorders can be associated with it. There can be prosthetic valve uh, presence, such as a mechanical or bioprosthetic valve. And infecto endocarditis can also be a cause of uh, AR in pregnancy. Now, what is the basic pathophysiology of AR? Here, there is a decrease in cardiac output uh, due to the regurgitation of a part of the ejected stroke volume. So basically, the, the patient suffers with decreased cardiac output state. Uh, because of uh, regurgitation, there is combined pressure and volume overload of the left ventricle. Now, how much of the regurgitation volume is, uh, uh, how much of the volume is coming back to the heart? It depends on the time that is uh, available for the regurgitant flow to occur, which is determined by heart rate and also the pressure gradient across the aortic valve, which is dependent on the uh, systemic vascular resistance. So the magnitude of aortic regurgitation is decreased by tachycardia, that is by allowing less time for regurgitation flow to occur. And also if the uh, SVR is decreased, then less uh, 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 regurgitant flow will occur and there is more forward flow. So therefore the magnitude of AR is less with tachycardia and peripheral vasodilatation. As we can see that uh, in pregnancy, there is, uh, sorry, as we can see in pregnancy, there is already tachycardia and uh, decreased systemic vascular resistance. That is why AR patients tolerated very well during pregnancy. Uh, there are certain 2D echo findings that we need to be aware of uh, in severe AR. Mostly we calculate that by looking at the regurgitant volume. If it is more than 60 ml, it is severe AR. And if more than 55% of uh, regurgitation fraction is coming back, 
then that is also indicative of severe AR. One second. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Prithika uh, ma'am. No, uh, feel... so my, a part of my presentation is still there. I think the screen sharing yeah, stopped yeah. on its own. I'll just uh, get back yeah, to yeah, the yeah. screen sharing once. Okay. Deepin, uh, Deepin will see any technical uh, issues. One minute. Huh. Yes. Sir, uh, uh, is my slide visible? Is it okay? Huh, this is okay. it's 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 uh, visible now. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So yeah, uh, yeah. the management of AR is based on this basic cardiac grid, which is uh, which indicates how much the preload, heart rate, or contractility and SVR should be. In AR, preload should be normal, maintained normal or slightly higher because we want to maintain the cardiac output. Heart rate should be normal or even slightly higher, like I said, tachycardia will decrease the regurgitate time. Uh, uh, for the flow to occur and therefore tachycardia is required, but not excessive tachycardia. Contractility should be normal or, or higher as we want to maintain the cardiac output and stroke volume. And systemic vascular resistance should be on the low, should be decreased because uh, the uh, valve gradient is uh, will, valve gradient, gradient will decrease and the forward flow will increase. So we need to ensure that there is a decreased SPR. Now, preload, like I said, it should be maintained normal or increased because aortic regurgitation normally decreases cardiac output and coronary blood flow. So, preload should be maintained so that stroke volume is maintained and hence cardiac output is maintained. However, we can't overload the patient as there is very high risk of pulmonary edema and heart failure in these patients, especially those patients with have low ejection fraction and uh, uh, decreased diastolic function and, uh, and systolic function in these patients. Uh, we need to give CVP guided fluid and strict input output charting need to be done. Adequate blood and blood products should be uh, ready to be transfused in case of uh, replacing the blood lost in uh, cesarean section. If the patient is in volume overload, diuretics need to be administered. And we need to ensure the patient is in left lateral position or uh, put a wedge on the right buttock to avoid IVC compression or aortocaval compression that can occur, that can lead to supine hypotension syndrome. Uh, again, coming back to cardiac grid, the heart rate has to be normal or increased. Like I said, uh, by maintaining a relatively high heart rate with normal sinus rhythm, it reduces the regurgitant fraction. It also ensures that cardiac output is maintained as cardiac output is uh, the, sum, the product of heart rate into a uh, stroke volume. However, excess tachycardia should be avoided because in these patients, uh, during diastole, the coronary perfusion is decreased because of regurgitation. So uh, we need to ensure that if, if there is excess tachycardia, then the, the coronary perfusion is decreased and the patient can have angina or myocardial infarction. So we need to be aware of that. Patient should be, to prevent any tachycardia, we need to treat any infection, anemia, uh, ensure that there is adequate blood and blood product transfusion. We should avoid sudden hypotension because of uh, sympathectomy or sudden sympathectomy in this, in this patients. That is why we give low dose spinal with uh, epi gradual epidural uh, anesthesia. We need to ensure the patient has adequate analgesia and we should also avoid bradycardia as because of bradycardia, the regurgitation time will increase and the patient will have decreased cardiac output. Again, contractility has to be normal or maintained uh, on the higher side to maintain cardiac output. It is important to note, even if the patient is uh, chronic, moderate to severe aortic regurgitation, the patient usually tolerates well as long as the uh, ejection fraction is preserved. Nevertheless, patients with severe aortic regurgitation are at very high risk of developing pulmonary edema due to heart failure. We need to minimize myocardial depression, which is usually occurring because of IV anesthetic agents. So we need to be mindful of that and maintain positive uh, inotropic uh, at all times. Uh, systemic vascular re resistance has to be decreased because uh, it improves uh, forward flow. Any increase in systemic vascular resistance can cause increase in regurgitant flow and decrease peripheral perfusion, leading to heart failure and pulmonary edema. 
So we need to treat preeclampsia and, high, and or hypertension uh, vigorously. We should avoid sympathomimetics or vasoconstrictors. Uh, if G is given, we should need to avoid uh, intubation and extubation responses. Uh, in aortic regurgitation, as I said, coronary flow is decreased during diastoles and uh, the reversal can occur even in severe AR. So we need to be mindful that we shouldn't decrease the BP too low. It should be maintained as a, up to 15% of the baseline is, uh, systolic blood pressure levels. Peripartum, uh, peripartum monitoring includes ECG, non-invasive IPP, pulse oximetry with capnogram and temperature, uh, and input-output fluid monitoring as a minimum uh, standard monitoring. Uh, however, invasive blood pressure can is may be needed in patients with WHO class two to three or patients with NYHA grade two above uh, cases. Other uh, monitoring methods that can be used are pulmonary artery pressure monitoring, pulmonary artery wedge pressure monitoring, or ABG analysis. Uh, Transesophageal echocardiography can be useful in patients who undergo deterioration intrapartum or may be posted for cardiac surgery uh, uh, alongside the the section. However, we need to be mindful of certain complications in these cases. Most commonly, we see heart failure in these patients and we should uh, avoid and treat accordingly. A uh, patient can go into pulmonary edema, can have myocardial infarction uh, intraoperatively. Postpartum hemorrhage is, uh, hemorrhage is common in these patients and we need to know that oxytocin infusion is preferred over bolus because otherwise it causes precipitous hypotension. At the same time, ergometrin and carboprost should be avoided. Ergometrin because it causes vasoconstriction and can cause increase in SVR and after load because of which regurgitation can increase and can cause the patient to go into heart failure. And carboprost can cause further uh, decrease, further uh, can cause uh, risk of pulmonary edema so that we should avoid it. Thromboembolism complications should be uh, noted if, if it occurs. Complications related to prostatic valves such as infective endocarditis or hemolysis can occur. So we need to be mindful of that. So these are my references. Thank you. Uh, on uh, Narendra sir's uh, topic. Uh, yes, now Narendra will speak. After that, at the end, uh, she will put my slides. Okay. You, will you no just stop sharing your slides? Okay, no problem. Should I start? Yes, yes. Narendra sir, you can. Am I audible to all? Yes, yes. You are audible. Uh, myself, Dr. Narendra Verma, working as an assistant professor in Department of Anesthesia and IR Hospital. Today, I am going to present a case of severe mitral regurgitation for lower segment caesarean section. Uh, most of the things related to the pregnancy with the volvular heart disease are covered very well by Dr. Kritika in the depth. So I will not go into the normal physiological changes and the other things happen with the volvular heart disease in the pregnancy. So I will mostly stick to the mitral regurgitation only and how we conduct these cases, even mitral regurgitation and other cases by combining multiple mode of anesthesia in a single case for better outcome of the uh, surgical skill. Uh, metamorphosis of pregnancy takes a heavy toll on female mentally, physically, and emotionally. The plethora of the changes take place in female in all system, but mainly on the heart and the vascular system. Presence of the heart disease, uh, either congenital or acquired, preconception can further complicate the pregnancy. The normal uh, heart disease uh, that complicates the pregnancy range from 0.2 to 3%. The overlap of uh, physiological changes of the pregnancy and the additional hemodynamic changes due to heart disease can affect both mother and fetus adversely. The better diagnostics tool and awareness have lead to the early detection and treatment of heart disease, better planning of pregnancy and improved peripartum management of pregnancy with cardiac disease. Now, in short, we will discuss the mitral regurgitation in pregnancy. 
the cardiovascular changes associated with pregnancy and delivery induce the progressive stress on both mother and fetus. This change is well tolerated by normal heart, but in the case of cardiac heart disease, there is a different picture. A multitude of changes occur in cardiovascular system during the pregnancy at the time of labor as uh, there is increase in the cardiac output with each, with each contraction by 10 to 25 percent. It occurs because of there with the each contraction there is auto transfusion of blood uh, of around 300 to 500 ml. Healthy are sustained these changes well but not the disease heart. Mitral regurgitation can go unnoticed during the pregnancy unless it is severe and symptomatic. The reason because the regurgitation regions are well tolerated than stenotic lesion. Increase the blood volume and reduce vascular resistance promote the forward cardiac output. So the regurgitation has the favorable scenario in pregnancy as compared to the stenotic lesion. The causes of mitral regurgitation may be the acute either in the form of uh, because of myocardial infarction or blunt chest trauma or rupture of cardiac tendon or papillary muscles and the infective carditis. And the chronic uh, may be because of rheumatic fever, then it mostly associated with the mitral regurgitation, connective tissue disorder, most common being the mucosomatic degeneration, mitral wall pro pro prolapse, all these are the chronic causes. The acute EMR, the pathophysiology of the acute MR. In acute MR, left ventricle, there is a volume overload to the left ventricle. And so there is an increase in the stroke volume, uh, including both forward and as well as regurgitator volume. Because of, uh, but there is a regurgitator volume, so there is a decrease in the forward stroke volume, so decrease in the cardiac output and the blood pressure. At the same time, the left atrium, because of the acute condition, it is not the compliant. So there is a volume pressure and overload that increases the sudden increase in the left atrial pressure. It may go up to the 25 to 30 mm of Hg with inhibit the proper drainage of the blood from lung to pulmonary veins and lead to acute pulmonary edema. In the chronic state patient, maybe the may have the compensated MR or may have the uncompensated MR. Then compensated MR, forward stroke volume is well maintained. And there is a decrease. In, uh, there is a decrease in the pulmonary congestion, so the patient can tolerate the mitral regurgitation very well. But what happened in the uncompensated MR? There is increase in end diastolic and the systolic volume of the left ventricle, which increase the wall, increase the wall stress of the left ventricle. And in uh, uh, gradually, there is the left ventricular dysfunction because of the calcium deposit in the myocyte, which further decrease the stroke volume. And for a decrease in the, but the final output is there is a decrease in the ejection fraction over a period of time. And backward, there is increase in the pulmonary congestion lead to pulmonary hypertension and patient may have the picture of congestive heart failure. Now I'm presenting the case which we have did by um, combining the different mode in the one case. The patient was a 33-year-old female gravitated to pa parity 1 and live birth 1, 39 weeks of gestation in the labor of post for urgent lower segment caesarean section in view of non-progression of the labor. Patient was admitted with a complaint of abdominal pain and pervaginal discharge since five, since five hours. Patient was, uh, patient was not a registered case at our hospital. But on the further history tracking, patient gave the history of frequent dyspnea on the exertion, NIA class 2, and the being diagnosed as a case of mitral regurgitation since 4 years. But uh, patient was on diuretic uh, tablet, furosemide 20 mg TDS and metoprolol 12.5 mg OD since diagnosis. But uh, she was on uh, irregular, treatment, uh, irregular treatment and stopped since post-conception. In the obstetric history, there was emergency uh, previous LACS seven year ago, uh, seven years ago, in view of fetal distress that go done under the regional and uneventful. There is no other operative history. There is no allergic or adduction history. On exam, the patient was averagely built of febrile pulse was around 80 beats per minute, present in all peripheral pulsation. BP was 100 to 160 mm of pallor was present, and the bilateral pitting edema was present. No other significant finding on the general examination. On systemic examination, patient was conscious, oriented, little bit restless with bilateral occasional fine basal capitation was present. 
uh, we roll out the basal crepitation by uh, taking by asking the patient to take deep breaths and the coughing, but still that present. So we conclude that it is a basal crepitations are present. Then the cardiovascular system apex be shifted to left and fourth intercostal space. On auscultation, there was a hollow systolic murmur was heard over the mitral area and radiating to the axilla. Really in the on investigation, hemoglobin was 10.9 and the rest of the in, uh, LFT, RFT platelet was within the normal limit. ECG uh, shows the sinus rhythm and the sign of LVH, prominent RV in the lateral chest and left exit deviation and left atrial dilatation that is uh, detected by the biopic P wave. 2D, 2D echocardiography report was available showing finding of thickened film mitral leaflet. LA was dilated, left ventricular hypertrophy and dilated, regurgitated uh, in the form of percentage of left atrium was around uh, 50% and regurgitated volume was around 55 ml per piece on the Doppler. So we conclude it is moderate to severe MR. Ejection fraction was also slightly decreased, that is 45 to 50. And there was also a moderate pulmonary hypertension. We did the ABG. ABG shows the pH was 7. 3, saturation was uh, 95 to 94 and PO2 was around 90 mm of Hg. Prior to procedure, blood group and cross matching was done. And anesthetic consideration and the goal for the MR pressure in the pregnancy is prevent the sudden increase in the systemic vascular resistance as increase in the systemic vascular resistance can increase the regurgitant fraction and decrease the cardiac output. Try to maintain the sinus rhythm maintain heart rate at normal or slightly increased rate, uh, aggressive treatment of atrial fibrillation if present, and optimize the forward flow by adequate left ventricular preload, but also avoid the excessive fluid administration as it take further push the leaflet away and increase the regurgitant fraction, and so that that can also lead to a right ventricular failure. Avoid the over to cavity compression to maintain the preload and the prevent Increase in the pulmonary arterial pressure by avoiding hypoxia, hypercarbia, hypothermia, acidosis, and mild hyperventilation is accepted. Avoid myocardial depression from the general anesthetic. Case management. The case management of sub patient in the pregnancy is multidisciplinary team approach by discussing with the cardiologist uh, and the obstetrician. Patient was taken up for the LACS after explaining the, uh, explaining the anesthetic procedure and the associate risk and taking the return and informed consent. All routine uh, monitors or uh, attached pulse oximetry, ECG, CAPNO, NIBP temperature were noted prior to the anesthesia induction. Before inducing the patient, we uh, took the right radial, uh, right arterial line and the right central venous cannulation after local and the IMLA application. Preparation of such patient in the OT involve the preparation, uh, make the infusion pump ready with the inodilator. We um, usually use here the dobutamine, defib defibrillator, vasopressor if uh, required the norepinephrine and diuretics. The aim of conducting such patient is maintaining hemodynamic stability and the safe execution of surgical procedure. The plan of anesthesia for this patient and other even including the stenotic lesions we combine the different mode of anesthesia like intravenous analgesia intrathecal opioid abdominal wall blocks and endo and endotracheal intubation before before inducing the patient we use the last 10 mg lasix in your fluid overload and pulmonary finding uh, Intravenous analgesia was given by injecting the uh, by IV paracetamol 1 gram, combining all these drugs in 100 ml of uh, normal saline, 1 gram uh, paracetamol, trimadol 25 mg, hylocard 1 to 1.5 mg per kg, and it is infused over the 15 to 20 minutes along with the injection deca intravenously. It is not mixed in the same point. The purpose of uh, this is not new and this is not now uh, this uh, intravenous analgesia cocktail is not new, but we combine the different mode in the same patient. Just the aim just to avoid the stress response to this volvular heart patient because of uh, stress of uh, general anesthesia like uh, laryngoscopic and intubation as well as the surgical stress. After that, uh, we uh, after that under all aseptic precaution, we inject the fentanyl 25 mics half cc. 
uh, after mixing it with the CSF and making the volume up to 0.8 ml and the sensory level was uh, at around uh, 8 T8 to T10. Uh, 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 fentanyl intrathecal is uh, compared to hypo, hypobaric, but uh, after mixing to the CSF, it is uh, like uh, isobaric, it acts like isobaric. After intrathecal fentanyl, we make patient supine and then we induce the patient by rapid sequence induction. The inducing agent used is etomidate. Is a total dose given is 13 mg and succinyl choline and relax with the succinyl choline 75 mg with the required patient. And all during the all the time we keep the wedge under the right hip. Laryngoscopy was done, airway was secured into trickle number seven and put on the mechanical ventilation. And patient maintain on the oxygen, air, and sevoflurane. MAC try to keep the MAC at titrate to 0.8 to 0.6 and uh, with the and uh, Intermittent bolus of rocuram is given. After the after that, we give the blind landmark guided bilateral transverse abdomen plane block using 0.2 percent rocuram and 30 ml, 15 ml on the east side. The whole purpose of uh, uh, combining all these modalities uh, just to avoid the stress response to the patient, uh, maybe may because of GA or surgical stress and avoiding land up into the complication of the volvular heart disease. That's like pulmonary edema, cardiac failure, and we conduct eight to 10 such cases by combining all these approaches go very well, including the moderate to severe stenotic lesion also. post delivery oxytocin was administered by three unit bolus and then the remain 20 unit per hour in the normal NS. Throughout the procedure, 30 to 300 to 400 ml of crystalloid was given and patient kept warm throughout the procedure. Fetal upgas score was also good at 0, 1 and 5 minutes was good. Uh, patient was reversed as uh, top one of 7 and extubate on OT table. Patient then kept into post anesthetic care unit and shifted to war after 24 hours. There are many, uh, there is uh, US FDA not approved the IV trimadol. Uh, for uh, during the pregnancy and the lactation, but the dose of Promedol we use is the 25 mg and many other people use it in the same dose. I, at this, this, there are the, there is no much comp uh, there is no much side effect to the maternal as well as fetal. There is no fetal bradycardia. We not find in any case there is any fetal bradycardia or anything else. Even the intrathecal fentanyl. It is a hypobaric, uh, but by diluting with the CSF, uh, it is come to be the, it uh, seems to be the more uh, isobaric. So there is a, but uh, the only issue with the segmental analgesia and the patchy effect with the fentanyl. So for better pain control, we combine all this with the tab block just for the uh, analgesia purpose and GA only to make patient unconscious and the relax. The, in conclusion, the physiological adaptation of pregnancy overlap with the pathology of regurgitated and wall may pose a challenge during the gestation and the, uh, peripartum prayer. Vigilant monitoring, early detection of the disease and its severity assessment help in redu uh, deducing a plan for smooth and comp complication free conduct of labor and delivery. Combination of both general or regional or combined in regional or general or with the uh, blocks you can then the case but the just we have to maintain the hemodynamic stability and keep the preparation of anticipated complication that can occur the, in such a volume religion uh, mitral regurgitation mitral stenosis uh, moderate as and the air can do either in the general or neuraxial block just to just we have to maintain the hemodynamic stability or we can combine all this uh, in the same same patient, prevent the complication of volvular because most of the time plain general anesthesia, plain general anesthesia land up with the complication of volvular and patient get the pulmonary edema or failure and most of the time it causes the fatal mortality and the GA drug has the uh, depression effect on fetus also. Thank you. Thank you, Narendra sir.
I think uh, uh, it's our stalwart uh, ma'am will speak after this. Before that, I want to uh, share to audience uh, that this is the second um, meet that ma'am is uh, presenting with their whole team. Before that, we we presented that cat lab uh, was presented by ma'am, and this one is the on ops. It's uh, very much question and answer will happen, but before that, we will share uh, key points from Lipika, ma'am. Then please. Okay, thank you, Director Sachin. Uh, I'll just ask uh, Kirtika to share the uh, share the slides. Yes, ma'am. Sharing the slides. Is it visible? Yeah. Uh, the current uh, burning issue. It is uh, actually it is all. Uh, told by Dr. Ashish, uh, Dr. Narendra and uh, Kirtika in uh, perspective to a cardiac regurgitant lesion because you all had uh, discussed about uh, the stenotic lesions uh, before like mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis. So we picked up these cases, but in general, in obstetric practice, uh, what we are uh, going to follow and what the re recent uh, literature is saying or guiding us. Next, Kirtika. Yeah, uh, coming to the obstetric uh, emergencies, they always pose a challenge to both us, uh, the anesthesiologist and obstetrician, because it has high maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality. Next. Next. Yeah. Uh, based on the urgency to conduct the caesarean section, Actually, um, they are always categorized as elective and emergency, but not all non-elective cases are emergencies. In emergency surgery, uh, there is a, a terminology used, uh, which is called as uh, DDI, as per the 2004 NICE guidelines. Uh, they have uh, divided it into urgent uh, and uh, planned emergencies. They have divided into uh, category one, category two, and three. Category one uh, is the one where we get only five to 10 minutes available uh, in minutes. Uh, and uh, by that time, the baby delivery has to be done. Uh, that Dr. Ashish uh, discussed before, which are the conditions they are given here in the left side. And here, uh, till now, the technique of choice is general anesthesia only, or uh, we can go for the rapid spinal anesthesia also. That I'll explain how, how we make the spinal rapid. If we know that the baby delivery time, that is category two, 10 to 15 minutes uh, are permitted for the baby delivery uh, time, then we can go for spinal anesthesia and still general anesthesia can be given uh, pertaining to the patient's uh, medical conditions and other conditions. And if it is uh, elective, then more than 20 minutes, then we can just uh, give the top up in the existing epidural or we can add spinal anesthesia and if the patient's condition demands, then we go for general anesthesia. Next. Yes, ma'am. Uh, coming to the decision to delivery, which one? The target uh, decision to delivery interval, which is known as DDI actually, uh, is uh, Actually, here the GA is supposed to have a very high mortality and morbidity, and uh, this uh, this still warrants the technique of uh, general anesthesia. This I discussed already. Next, yes, yes, yes. yeah, uh, coming to the uh, coming to the pre-op assessment of uh, uh, these patients. Uh, here we have to do a very rapid anesthesia assessment. Uh, here we have to, it's a must, even though we are giving spinal, we have to assess the patient for risk of difficult airway, risk of obstetric hemorrhage. Like here we have to take consideration of uh, all these uh, placental conditions and uh, the risk of aspiration. Uh, and uh, pre-op investigations, we keep it to minimum, uh, like complete blood count, blood grouping and cross-matching, RFT, LFT and coagulation profile when it is needed. Here, I would like to say that uh, while we are uh, assessing the patient for obstetric hemorrhage, uh, like placenta, abruptio placenti or placenta accreta is there, uh, like uh, there we have to have the coagulation profile INR done because preoperatively they are sent to the radiological uh, 
uh, unit to embolize the patient, like through uh, uterine artery, they put uh, the this and the they embolize and they keep the balloon put there in the previous day, uh, which is uh, placed in the uh, up to the internal uh, so that the bleeding is less when the section is being done next day. Uh, in KEM, it is a very routine practice, like many cases they have been doing. And uh, uh, there we need the coagulation profile, a proper INR done. Otherwise, uh, in other cases uh, where we have uh, patients who are coming with prosthesis, uh, heart valve, then in those cases, or they are on particular uh, drugs, in those cases only we need it. Otherwise, we are going to ask for all these uh, investigations for a, uh, for a normal cesarean section patient. Next. Yeah, uh, then here uh, it is uh, a new, all patients uh, coming for two sections, as I told you, has to be prepared for GA and hemorrhage uh, preventive measures that to be taken. Uh, here, a uh, terminology is being used uh, to improve the better outcome of the neonate that is called in utero resuscitation of the fetus. Uh, where uh, where it is mandatory to maintain the position, uh, left lateral uterine position is to be maintained. Oxygenation has to be done uh, of the mother. And uh, intravenous crystalloids uh, adequate uh, has to be given so that hypotension is prevented. And a target uh, blood pressure is uh, maintained, like to maintain the perfusion, to maintain the uterine perfusion and uh, very low tolerance for hypotension. And uh, tocolysis uh, has to be done like with uh, turbute uh, 250 microgram subcutaneous or uh, GTN 400 microgram meter dose uh, uh, aerosol doses. And uh, here, uh, of course, acid aspiration prophylaxis is a must as we know that uh, they are very much uh, prone for uh, aspiration uh, due to the pregnancy conditions, which are the changes. And uh, difficult airway preparation always a mandatory part of uh, part of the preparation uh, while providing spinal anesthesia also, and intravenous access securing is a must. And invasing, uh, invasive monitoring, uh, if time permits, in uh, cardiac patients having cardiac lesions, which are uh, grade three. Next. So coming to the uh, anesthesia for category one uh, cesarean section. Of course, here, as I told you, it is the uh, rapid sequence induction of GA is the mode of choice of anesthesia, and uh, rapid delivery of fetus is the goal. Next. So here, uh, here maternal assessment and uh, stabilization from time to time decision has to be taken, like about the maternal condition and the uh, fetal monitoring also uh, plays a big role here. And uh, uh, IV induction agents regarding that, yeah, of course, pre-oxygenation is a must here. It is practiced. Uh, tidal volume um, breath is given for three minutes or four to eight vital capacity breath is given. And uh, IV induction agents about this uh, thiopentone five milligram per kg along with succinylcholine is still the preferred method and uh, it is still coming in the literature for Indian population. And um, of course, rocuronium subamidex is going to replace it soon uh, if uh, it is available and it turns out to be economical. And uh, otherwise, uh, ketamine and etomidate uh, might help us uh, for treating such kind of patients. But propofol is not to be preferred in these obstetric uh, population because uh, it, uh, it is associated with a worse neonatal profile. Uh, neonatal outcome is not so good if you compare with other inhalational agents. And required pressure, we start giving from the time of uh, just when we start inducing the patient from 10 newton towards uh, the loss of, uh, loss of consciousness uh, up to 30 newtons we can increase. And regarding the opioids, uh, fentanyl up to 25 mics are okay. Um, and sufent we can use, of course, remifentanyl. But uh, still morphine has a place. But... Uh, but that interferes with the upguard score definitely. Uh, morphine and other norphine. Still, it is a practice in adding into spinal anesthesia sensor cane and using it. But uh, then we have to be very careful about the uh, the neonatal uh, aspect of it, and the pediatrician is to be informed about it. 
And uh, if there is a difficulty in intubating the patient, then second generation supra airway devices uh, have a role. And uh, coming to the perioperative care, the minimum monitoring standards along with uh, ETCO2 monitoring is must. Then uh, extubation is another stressful condition while giving general anesthesia to this group of patients uh, because um, the, they are more prone for hypotension, hypertension, depending on what they have gone through. And uh, that is also becoming a critical uh, event in the course of uh, general anesthesia. Next. So coming to the uh, this rapid sequence spinal anesthesia, here if the epidural catheter is already in place for uh, providing flavor anesthesia, then uh, a top-up uh, can be given, but it is always to be confirmed that uh, the epidural catheter is in place. And uh, here, uh, the skilled anesthesiologist has to give the spinal anesthesia because here the timing is a factor and the block has to be successful. Here, the lim we have to limit the number of attempts and if the spinal action is delayed, then there has to be very low threshold for providing general anesthesia. And of course, 0.5% BP vacuum heavy and 0.75% rupee vacuum are used, no touch technique. And immediately the surgery has to be started once T10 sensory level is reached. Next. 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 Next one, Kittika. Uh, go to go to next, yeah. Yeah, here, uh, here we use spinal or epidural anesthesia as the technique of choice. And uh, here the GA is not so much preferred in these category of patients due to uh, high risk of uh, complications of GA. Next. Uh, next, Kittika. Uh, please go to the next one, Kirtika. Yeah, coming to the complications of emergent infection, uh, here I would like to emphasize more on these two kind of complications because we get stuck usually due to these complications because providing anesthesia and uh, spinal anesthesia, we all uh, train our trainees very well and they become adept in providing that. But uh, when these complications occur, like uh, first I'll discuss about the anesthetic complication, like uh, failed intubation or aspiration or failed neuroaxial block. Uh, previous one, previous one, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, then uh, suppose we, uh, we are with the anesthetic complications, then there we have to have our... Um, First thing is uh, we have to take very fast uh, judgment regarding failed intubation, and we have to uh, we have to realize that pulmonary aspiration has taken place. And if it is a failed neuroaxial block, then we should have very low threshold for converting into general anesthesia, and uh, realizing the complications of uh, uh, hypotension and or delayed action of the spinal anesthesia or any other problems because inadequate. Anesthesia and analgesia also gives rise to other compli complications at this point. And of course, we have to uh, recognize the allergic uh, reactions, like in terms of anaphylaxis, or it can be LA anaphylaxis, or it can be to any, any agent which is being used. And awareness during anesthesia, obstetric awareness is a very big factor. It is very traumatic. And uh, of course, extensive spinal anesthesia or high spinal block has to be recognized and to be treated. Coming to the surgical complications, like hemorrhage is the biggest killer in this uh, category of patients. So as I told you, if preoperatively we know that uh, the placenta accreta or all these placental conditions are involved, then we can take the uh, radiologist's uh, help. Then we need a good communication and uh, decision-making uh, with obstetricians so that uh, the balloon can be put in place. Uh, so that at least uh, the loss of five liters can be reduced to two liters and uh, the hemorrhage, uh, it makes a big difference in the patient's uh, management. And of course, thromboembolism is, as soon as it happens, it has to be detected and treated immediately. It can be amniotic fluid embolism, it can be a DVT, and it can be any other embolization which can happen. So uh, 
these two things, they can happen anytime and we have to maintain constant vigilance for that. And of course, uh, if the surgeon is doing delayed extraction, then there is risk to the fetus. And amniotic fluid embolism can happen uh, by the time they deliver the child and uh, uh, the uh, placenta is getting delivered. And maternal collapse, uh, we know that uh, various causes and maternal collapse uh, causes and uh, management is, uh, is a must for us when we attend to obstetric uh, category of patients. Next. Uh, coming to the uh, three most common causes of maternal mortality and brain injury, uh, it is failed intubation, it is high neuralgia, anesthesia or high spinal and thromboembolism. Next, so coming to the management of failed intubation, obstetric airway is always uh, any time, even though we, are, we have given the spinal anesthesia, it, it is an anticipated difficult intubation all the time throughout till the baby is delivered and the case is finished. And change, suppose we are uh, not being able to intubate the patient, then change of hands, a change of equipment. And now uh, it is said that video laryngoscopes can be very useful. And supraglottic airway device can be kept as a plan B. Through that, if uh, the, um, the flexible bronchoscope is uh, put, then that can also help. Then maintain the oxygenation, uh, that is the biggest priority, but it is seen that unfortunately high frequency uh, nasal uh, oxygen, which, uh, which is being used in other uh, category of patients have helped so much. They apparently, they worsen uh, the uh, saturation, the SpO2 values don't come up in pregnant patient, unfortunately, so they don't help. And uh, front of neck access in CVCO scenario, uh, pre-procedural uh, USG can assist. And any time pulmonary aspiration has happened, even under spinal anesthesia, it has to be detected because it can worsen the situation even more, even in GA, in failed intubation, or in spinal. Next. Uh, coming to massive obstetric hemorrhage, which is a major cause of mortality again, uh, here uh, we would like to know that transfusion trigger is usually seven, HP of seven in the face of uh, uh, bleeding or constant bleeding like that is uh, changing this because if it is uncontrolled uh, hemorrhage which is going on, then uh, we have to anticipate and we have to procure blood and we have to give it blood, blood products. So uh, that is a, uh, that for that we have to take uh, uh, the experience of the seniors and uh, we have to take a, a really a, immediate stand and we have to make the blood available because we have lost uh, patients due to providing them blood later on. When they needed, they could not receive the blood. So when the anaerobic um, metabolism sets in, then if we transfuse, it's not going to help the patient. So the decision has to be made uh, earlier and faster. And regarding the antifibrinolytic, like Franexa one gram IV within the in uh, caesarean section, is a must like there is a, a very a very positive uh, very positive feedback by the women trial uh, that is a big uh, multi uh, multi hospital uh, multi uh, country trial where they advocate that one gram iv tranexa should be given within 3 hours of uh, cesarean section procedure uh, not in vaginal uh, delivery but in uh, cesarean section and uh, that really brings down the bleeding a lot then uh, the fibrinogen level in the face of PPH is 100% predictive of outcomes. Like if the fibrinogen level is falling, if it is less than two gram per deciliter, then uh, uh, we have to uh, replace with cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen. And if there is more than five liters of loss, then, then also we have to give uh, cryo and fibrinogen. And uh, placental abruption, uh, as I told you before, like in case of... Uh, if it is known like a placenta uh, accreta spectrum, any patient is lying on that. Uh, we have to take interventional uh, radiology consultation and uh, intervention. And uh, uh, we have to give them immediately blood, blood products along with platelets and cryoprecipitates. And of course, viscoelastic uh, POC test uh, guides the transfusion wherever it is available. Next. 
coming to the other crisis which we face in this uh, uh, obstetric uh, group, like when they have this pet or uh, preeclamptic uh, traits, that is hypertensive crisis. So there usually the systolic BP is more than or equal to 160 millimeter mercury and diastolic is more than equal to 110 on two separate occasion, at least four hours apart. And uh, here, uh, all these, they, uh, they positively, they, they have the adverse cerebral events, which is very real. So we should be always trying to prevent it by using ismolol or labetolol and uh, proper antihypertensive drugs are to be given. Then uh, it has to be detected. And uh, of course, the, if the PIH component is there, then Maxself has to be given, the regime has to be maintained throughout. So this also gives rise to uh, the unwanted crisis, which the anesthetist only has to manage very operatively. Next. So to conclude, the emergencies in obstetric uh, practice poses a unique challenge to the obstetric anesthesiologist. Uh, even though uh, they are rare, a high stake and high dynamic events with potential for rapid deterioration of both mother and the fetus are there and multidisciplinary teamwork is needed. And we are actually the peripatum physicians who have to take care of two lives and training and simulation and obstetric emergency scenarios can really improve the outcome with obstetric anesthesiologist playing the central role. So we must prime ourselves for our training and learning the decision making in the face of changing scenario. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, very elaborate thought. But, uh, you cover almost everything on Obesio. And uh, we, as an anesthetist, uh, run at any time when sections fall come. So a lot of questions will come. Uh, first of all, I want to share one uh, thing. That what effects on CVPS uh, cases like uh, uh, aortic regurgitation and uh, mitral regurgitation cases, it was seen in methargin effects mainly. So, ma'am, thank you, ma'am. Uh, how to handle these two drugs, ketosine and methargine, in uh, yeah, uh, card cardiac compromised patients, yeah. basically? Uh, uh, methargine is to be avoided, but um, oxytocin in each the small bolus really up to five and then later on uh, because see the uh, the uterus has to contract also well so it's okay to yeah. avoid methargen but uh, carboprost um, like it can to permanently if it is given graded dose then it is okay hello hello yes sir yes sir Yes, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, the basic what we can do the best is uh, we should give initially a bolus of about three to five of pitocin and then uh, pitocin is given as an infusion as a new norm. That is 20 units of pitocin should be diluted till 20 cc and given over 5 ml per hour so that there is no breakthrough contraction. Sometimes what happens, the uterus contract then it again becomes relaxed. So it has to be given in an infusion rather than on a full bolus. Methagen is definitely to be avoided and carboprost has to be taken with care. These are some of the new norms which are followed. And a new drug which has came instead of pitocin, that is a carbutocin. Yes, yes. That I is a new drug. Sure. So that was the coming uh, recent trend regarding that, which will avoid. Yes, yes, sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. So how about uh, carbutoxin? Uh, uh, what is your uh, experience on that? Uh, carboprostin is very dangerous for cardiac patients, especially when considered to be coronaries and also for lungs. It is better to be avoided. Even some uh, gynecologists prefer to give carboprost 
in the uterine directly i think you must be yes 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 this. but this is a quite yes, dangerous yes. procedure because we might just land up the patient with a coronary events so better the more important practices to be avoided in something like asthmatic patient uh, other thing is you don't have to give the full dose you can give half dose or one full dose and uh, basically pitocin is given as a basic drug and carbapitocin sos if required better to be avoided just try to give one fourth of hard or half drug i am that also after aspiration for the blood okay sir sir uh, newer drug is coming uh, instead of pitocin uh, many of gynecologists asking for carboxytocin one drug is coming yes, sir. yeah yes yeah. carboxytocin and and that drug related to cvts cases or uh, any uh, regurgitation cases Uh, yeah, that is which is not going to be an infusion, but uh, the bolus has to be given around about ten to twelve minutes, twelve to fifteen minutes. But I have not used it. I just used it once outside. But as per the reports, it is supposed to be very very stable and causes minimum of, of the hypotension. And it uh, okay. basically once the uterus starts contracting, it doesn't go out of that. Uh, the problem which we face <laughs> with pitocin. Similarly, what they tell is uh, it doesn't cause much of a water retention, and it is caused by pitocin. So it is much okay. Better. So we can safely give carboxytocin. Yes, yes. Currently, KU yes. is using lot of carboxytocin, so I think we can use this new drug. And uh, we use lots of fluid for giving pitocin also, because yes, yes, uh, yes. in norms we generally pass a 500 ml of DNS or 5% or NS and put yes, yes, 20 yes. units, so that adds to the fluids of the patient plus the auto transfusion which comes, so it causes edema, more chances. So it will be uh, from. Uh, stalwarts in student stalwarts uh, speakers we can use carboxytocin easily on yeah, definitely definitely yes yes cardiac compromised patients easily so yeah. on normal patient you can use easy definitely start using on normal then we can come on the hard that's better when <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> so that was the really we need to hear from you uh-huh. basically it's a, a under trial drug um, for private forum point of view So yeah, we are but, uh, really, but uh, start because KM really? is using uh, my wife is in KM, so she uses regularly. It is giving good okay. results. So that's okay. why I'm telling. Nayar so 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 sir sir has mentioned especially for us that her wife is anesthetist and no, she is using gynec. regular. Okay, she is a gynec. So I <laughs> I handle both things. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I have to take care of the uterine contraction of her also. So that's better. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sir. So one thing I want to ask from uh, Kadek point of view, uh, Kritika mentioned in uh, one slide that uh, we need a CVTS clearance for uh, that yeah. case of CVT uh, cesarean section in uh, I think aortic regurgitation like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Our private forum point of view, we we are uh, very much scarcity of CVTS surgeons. Basically, yeah. we we have cardiac uh, person but not CVTS. And in that case, how can we um, recognize that? Uh, I should. Basically, uh, uh, basically, we don't want clearance as such. We just want an opinion of an expert person. So something okay. like CVTS or cardiology, just regarding the management of tachycardia and. Uh, Uh, hypotension basically it becomes a medical legal issue rather than uh, what is required because they cannot come directly for intervention but basically what has to be done because they are more expert and they handle these cases in and out so they have a better hand of that actually in uh, where there is a valve replacement done already in those cases yes ma'am yeah. it's more uh, more relevant because uh, the patient is already on warfarin and uh, already a uh, prosthesis is a prosthetic valve is already in place so there okay for a choked uh, valve scenario has happened yeah. like already the patient has been uh, if the warfarin and all these uh, inr and everything is not maintained the land Uh, valve scenario post procedure yeah. post section it has happened so that has to be taken care of so overall uh, i think so uh, that uh, cvts point of view when uh, Andrei's was from Somaya, ma'am. I think so. 
मैम यू कैन अनमूट योर सेल्फ एंड कैन आस्क क्वेश्चन till then i want to ask uh, about one question from uh, narendra sir's uh, case that he mentioned about fentanyl in intrathecally and then uh, he mentioned about uh, ga for relaxation and uh, stabilization of cvt cvs system so sir uh, is it okay to give uh, intrathecal fentanyl or what i can say leo and we no ropivacaine drugs yes sir we can search find the ropivacaine or bupivacaine in the low dose or uh, 2.5 mg of bupivacaine is also enough and uh, we, we just try to avoid the local anesthetic and we are trying to use just so pure opioid for better hemodynamic stability combination okay. also the good but there is also some fluctuation in hemodynamic in the low dose that time we will No need to do a pan barbiturin. The volume is also approximately one ml. It is also it is also even fentanyl. Ah, uh, try to try to use the fentanyl intrathecally or intrathecally. Initially, you can find the find the there is a some segment of the taxi loss. Hello. हॅलो 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 येस वी कॅन हिअर एनिथिंग एल्स सर सचिन वी कॅन्ट हिअर यू नाउ आय कॅन हिअर येस मे बी आय एम या या आय एम ऑन मॉड्यूल या so narendra uh, i'm i'm uh, what i want to say is uh, we are the private forum uh, point of view i am asking this question that you use in your case uh, regional fentanyl yes, okay. yeah with that you use the ga for that yes. case yes sir uh, for uh, you are mentioned that uh, you use ga for reason of relaxation point of view and cardiac vascular It's stability cardiac point of view relaxation point of view yes sir yeah yeah but even in uh, nowadays uh, people are really using segmental spinal or uh, low dose of spinal cases yes sir uh, yeah uh, from that point of view you can share your thoughts with our viewers so that they can uh, easily do these cases in a private point of view. or segmental spinal is about uh, 1.5 to 2 ml but uh, in the section the segment because of that hypoborosity and the position is very difficult to predict the spread and to cover because we have to cover at least p4 otherwise we can give the segmental spinal but in the volvular or cardiac patient severe patient we generally avoid the spinal altogether so only use fentanyl uh, yes, that was the low dose of uh, bupivacaine or ropivacaine is also good sir is also good option okay thank you narendra immunogenic uh, stability that's all yes yes from somaya and jawa uh, i think jaya has raised they both hand uh, raise hands if any question from uh, yeah yeah somaya can you ask please unmute yourself and can ask no sir i don't have any questions jaya 
you raise hand i think you have any question please ask i think uh, jay also don't have any question so overall ma'am uh, we know as a anesthetist uh, related to both drugs that carboxyn new drug is coming in our prior forum point of view and uh, cvts uh, cases uh, generally we don't have uh, cardiothoracic surgeons at our places one 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 question on that only that uh, in which cases we really need cvts uh, opinion for going for caesar yeah as i told you like whenever they are coming with the uh, they are uh, with uh, bioprosthesis valve or mechanical valve in those cases we require yeah. uh, so, previous and after the procedure because suppose they bleed and some blood blood products or some plasma ffp are given or sometimes okay. the, the gynecologists uh, they stop altogether the any kind of usually they are on what for it they all together this topic only so in the land of the post partum period the land yes. of the choked valve scenario that is like uh, life threatening like it becomes an emergency absolute emergency so at least whoever is there so to our honor dignity also you can just contact the center so at least the to be for something they can make out the valve functioning and because they become breathless for post operatively they become breathless which is mismatched uh, to their uh, clinical scenario like it's not related to the section condition it is because of their deterioration valvular wise the valve stop functioning okay so guys only very very uh, patient came to us that mm. wall replacement cases or maybe related to wall or, yeah or if they are very badly regurgitant lesions like uh, beyond uh, grade 4 or so where they can't lie down because the regurgitant lesions they behave uh, very um, very badly like in face of bleeding or when they get very well like their uh, hbr and all these things if it changes if the pain relief is not taken care or they they have got a uh, while delivering uh, all these uh, drugs and fluids a lot of interplay all this can happen then they can have sudden pulmonary edema they can have usually they go into pulmonary edema and they become dyspneic and low output okay. state is fast so, so that time so we need after the baby is delivered uh, then they have we can at least go for a follow up for their condition okay. then it works okay. okay so thank you ma'am on this note basically we are related to worry about cardiac output mainly and uh, that thing was really uh, cleared cleared uh, mentioned by kritika yadav narendra varma sir and ashish mai sir and on top of cherry uh, lipika ma'am really clear cut mention about that thing uh, you know one about pitocin mitharjan they mentioned really good on that thing uh, ma'am uh, whatever we learn in our practices that we uh, go for uh, distress patients very fastly that mm. call come from obgy person <laughs> that, they, uh, that there is a distress and we go for that medical legal aspect also to that later on now yes nowadays yeah 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 mm. so really medical legal point of view also you have to worry on that thing also that you cannot uh, even uh, go for any caesar section in distress medically legally it's safe that you are saving a child and mother for that mm -hmm. cases and this is life saving procedure we are going for, for uh, day and night but overall uh, sometime we miss uh, these procedures uh, cvt as point almost uh, cardiac point of view actually even uh, respiratory point of view we can manage uh, on table also but a uh, serious point of view really it's a very difficult to manage uh mm -hmm. with without any other colleague also because sometimes yes, uh, fail, cardiac failure is really very something uh, that one case happened at uh, rajasthan mm -hmm. that gynecologist was expired uh, yeah. but really uh, 
cardio uh, myopathy post op pnc patients in intra op uh, cardiac myopathy is happen so really uh, use drugs very judiciously what yes, uh, Naren, is very yeah, yeah. Yeah. yes and this yes, technique yes. is really good which you described like uh, giving only fentanyl without adding any any yes, other yes, yes. chain or anything along with GF is very stable and very you are in control like yes 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 yeah. So I'm uh, I'm uh, on our uh, society point of view. I'm uh, appeal to all mm -hmm. our members that we are uh, very much fortunate that this case bit uh, is happening with uh, Lipik ma'am, and all our queries almost I think so no question from any audience. Uh, everyone uh, was satisfied with these case mix. Okay, thank you, Sachin, uh, Sachin for giving sir. us opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Hello, ma'am. Yes, 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 sir. Yeah, just just one last note that the gold standard of uh, clinical things still remains with the stethoscope and clinical evaluation on the patient. Really, really. your main query was there. The gold standard really, still really. remains the stetho. The most work of the anesthetist is just put a stetho on the chest to see the chest, that is the lungs, as well as the lung for the for the heart for any murmur. That is still the gold standard. That will say really, 50 percent of you and the good communication skills with the patient as well as the relative. That will solve really, at least really. 70%, 75% of the problems and take care. Sir, uh, I work in uh, municipal corporation. Uh, actually, I want to share one uh, with you yes, also yes. and ma'am also. Actually, uh, I'm working in municipal corporation at Nanded. Uh, out of 40, I mentioned one note, mehendi or nail polish, whatever it is on, I will not allowed that patient in OT Good. because because that SPO2 is maintaining was my my aim to that cases so I never allowed these patients first of all then other things is very far related to CVTS and uh, even thyroid cases and all uh, most of the time uh, even mesolam we gave and uh, patient went into apnea that yes. can happen yeah so so really we should uh, really serious about uh, these things and uh, judiciously use your drugs what i yes. what madam mentioned in this. so this uh, i think uh, flame i say flame is going on uh, all over in yes yes, <laughs> in yes. <street. laughs> exciting yeah, yeah we are dis discussing on obgy that was both things are really uh, it's post Navratri. We are uh, yes. yes. Uh, this uh, these things are uh, happening, but overall, uh, I I will uh, thank you to Lipika ma'am uh, because she was the lady. He actually when I want to uh, when I ask him that one one topic or one question, she uh, she clearly mentioned I will take two case mits, nothing to worry, and that that happened today. I'm really uh, thank you to Narendra Kumar, Ashish Mali sir, even Rameshwar, our junior, so Kritika Yadav, and uh, Lipika ma'am, I'm hats off to you that whenever any question or anything, I'm uh, ready to for you. Uh, I think Varsha ma'am uh, yes, yes. mentioned Supam, Super. madam. Yeah, my family is always great, and because of that, I am doing this thing. <laughs> really, and uh, next time, uh, Indraini ma'am is coming on our platform, and then the way ma'am is also coming on our platform. With that, one private forum person, Raju Chok, uh, Tushar Chokis sir, uh, he is coming on our platform. Uh, Opaid free anesthesia and uh, Tiva, uh, he will make the scene for private forum i'm i'm actually uh, lost my academic touch uh, when i pass out from nair but now i am coming to <laughs> academic point of view basically i want to share uh, my our all private forum person that they can uh, watch these videos in when they are free time and when maybe sometime uh, people are coming very less in our academic meets but our mention is that uh, everybody should touch with academic and one uh, data is there in from us point of view uh, us academician uh, mention in their any one 
case meets or conference something like that they mentioned that burnout of uh, private forum practitioner or doctors is due to less academic touch with or less academic uh, touch so uh, we are in touch with academics then less burnout of in your private practice so i am doing this thing uh, these things to daily academic uh, touch will really help you in your day to day practices so thank you thank you all uh, all of you from isa nanded especially ma'am i'm really thankful you thank you all it was nice thank you all good night thank you sir good night sir thank you sir thank you ma'am okay thank you thank you sir thank you sir